Thanks so much to Samir and the Institute for this uh, great uh, opportunity. I'm, I'm really happy to be here talking about this. I'm um, uh, born and raised in uh, Burnaby, British Columbia, and I'm now out in the British Columbian diaspora in Eastern Canada. Uh, so it's really, um, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a privilege to come. I did a couple of degrees at Simon Fraser, so it's really great to, to come back here. Um, and especially to talk about this, uh, this topic, um, in a way, coming to talk, talk about this topic is a, is a coming home as well, of course. Uh, I'm a uh, scholar of uh, communication technology, which might make it seem like talking about pipelines and, and grain handling infrastructure is kind of strange, but I, as you'll see, I try to treat them in a way as communications media and from the perspective of how a communications media scholar might think about these infrastructures. Uh, I'm also keenly aware that I don't live here anymore. Right? And it's been uh, some years since I lived here. And, uh, and I'm very aware of, of, of the way in which being away gives one a partial view on very intense uh, issues that are unfolding in a place that you no longer live. So I'm, I'm, I feel both um, kind of privileged to be here in front of this audience who knows a lot about this topic and, and probably a lot more even than I do. And so I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing from you about where you think I have it wrong or where you think what I've said is, uh, is, is missing something. Uh, so with that, to begin. So. Uh, the list seems to grow daily. Uh, the Keystone XL, the Enbridge Northern Gateway, the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Twin, uh, Enbridge's proposed Line 9B reversal, which will be in, in my backyard, um, the Trans Canada Energy East pipeline that will carry bitumen from Alberta as far as the Irving refineries in St. John, New Brunswick, where I also lived for a few years near that refinery. Uh, yet another speculation about another foray up the Mackenzie River Valley to the Beaufort Sea. On yet, as yet unnamed propositions to move bitumen to the port at Churchill, uh, Manitoba, now that its, uh, its, uh, its use as a grain handling uh, port is, is decreasing with the uh, Tories' uh, dismantling of the Canadian Wheat Board. Uh, these days, pipeline developments associated with the exploitation of Alberta's bitumen deposits have become a central site, or medium, if you will, of political contestation in Canada, one whose significance, I would argue, actually rivals that of other more conventional media with which we associate the, po the possibility <laughs> of politics. Um, so I'm gonna I want to note here uh, from the outset that my focus is going to be on the politics of pipelines in Canada, and specifically the pipelines linked to the the exploitation of the oil sands. This isn't because this is the only place uh, in the world where there are pipelines or the only place where politics attaches to them. Um, as uh, James Marriott and uh, Mika Minio Paluello have shown in their remarkable book on the vast system of pipelines and tankers that carry oil from the Caspian Sea to London, England. Long before there was an information superhighway, there was an oil road and before there was an internet, there was a carbon net, which in its way carried, or sorry, created a more globally extensive, encompassing, and connective space of flows than the one that is attributed to digital network technologies. There is no continent today that is not festooned with oil and gas pipelines or on which there are not plans for major expansions of existing pipeline networks. The Pipeline and Gas Journal's 2012 Worldwide Worldwide Pipeline Construction Report lists 118,000 miles, or 191,000 kilometers, of pipelines planned and under construction and, uh, around the world for completion by uh, 2015. Seventy-five percent of them are gas, the rest oil. Now that's enough pipe to cross Canada, which might not be a big country, but it is a wide country, uh, roughly 35 times. The bulk of these are concentrated in North America, and the Asia-Pacific region, primarily China and India, but there's, again, nowhere where pipelines are not a proliferating infrastructure. And while the behavior of petrochemical companies and the states that court them show certain consistencies across time and space, there is, of course, also much that's situationally specific uh, about what pipeline and resource developments mean 
in different global contexts and about how differential experiences and histories of colonialism and empire bear on political subjectivities in relation to these developments. And there's much that's particular about the institutional, economic, and cultural frameworks in which the politics around them unfold in any given interest. So when it comes to the politics of pipelines, there's simultaneously nothing special, but also much that is particular about Canada. And so I'm going to restrict myself to talking about the place I know, place, as I said before, I suspect you might know even better than I do, uh, and that's Canada. Right. In lieu of casting some sort of universalist gaze on the politics of pipelines the world over. So, most of the pipelines that have captured so much political attention in Canada, the Keystone XL, the Northern Gateway, the Trans Mountain Twin, the Energy East, have not even been built yet, and so have never carried nor leaked a single drop of oil or gas. Curiously, it's in their potential existence that they've gathered our attention. Right? It's in their virtuality that they've become present. It's in their promise that they've emerged as what the philosopher of technology Bruno Latour calls matters of concern long before they have materialized as matters of fact. Pipelines thus sponsor a sort of politics of anticipation that implies the essential contingency of genuinely political situations. In this sense, pipelines are political not because something has happened, there's been a leak, right? but because something could possibly happen, which is to say they could be stopped right? or disrupted in a manner that might prompt something else to happen. And it's in that possibility, the possibility that something other than what already is happening could happen Right, that pipelines comprise the site of such political intensity at the present moment in North America. Uh, with the exceptions of some instances of direct action, most of the politics around these pipelines is unfolding within the parameters of what I would call the liberal democratic politics of publicity, the contest of arguments, the contest of interests and reasons and informal and informal venues, the marshalling of evidence and information in an effort to gather support and to persuade public opinion and public decision makers, and the organization and demonstration of contesting propositions in the public sphere. I'm going to return to that sort of politics in a little while, but what I want to do tonight instead is focus on the potential for pipelines to mediate a more materialist and less discursive form of politics, a politics that exceeds democratic publicity and turns on the question of mobility. In this case, the mobility of a staple commodity. And the manner in which infrastructures for moving staple commodities provide a unique site for political action pursuant to winning progressive gains or even radical changes in the material organization of our lives. What I want to explore is whether there's something special about pipelines as sites of political contest and possibility, something that attaches specifically to their material character as infrastructures for the movement of a staple commodity, something that we can't really appreciate if we treat them just as we would any other issue over which we might argue in the liberal democratic public sphere. Now, we Canadians, especially we Canadian media scholars who stand on the shoulders uh, of Harold Innes, know very well that the movement of staples, the movement of staple commodities, is a form of communication right, of equal political significance to any utterance. Right? To explore this possibility in relation to pipelines, I want to spend a little bit of time laying out some arguments from Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy, Political Power in the Age of Oil. I want to take some time to, with these arguments, right, and then think about to what extent the politics he describes might apply to the case of the oil sands pipelines. So Mitchell's foundational claim is that political power is assembled and organized around the production and distribution of carbon energy. Now that sounds straightforward enough, right? 
But this is neither the standard claim that carbon energy made modern industrialism possible, it did, nor the claim that oil profits drive the militarist politics of empire, they do, right? nor even the claim that reliance on wealth generated by petroleum production makes petrostates and even petro provinces pathological basket cases. It, it does, right? It does. But that's not Mitchell's case here. Mitchell's case is, uh, is one that focuses on the political affordances of the organization and control of the movement of carbon energy and the infrastructure that enables this movement. As he writes, political possibilities are opened up or narrowed down by different ways of organizing the flow and concentration of energy. And these possibilities are enhanced or limited by arrangements of people, finance, expertise, and violence that are assembled in relationship to the distribution and control of energy. It is the movement of concentrated stores of carbon energy that provides the means for assembling effective democratic claims. So in this, Mitchell is lighting upon something that's, I think, essentially true about commodities and which goes to the very heart of any economy that's based on their exchange. <coughs> because while we might entertain conflicting opinions about the state of peak oil, the relationship between <coughs> fossil fuel use and climate change, and the economic effects of increased consumption taxes, this much we can say with certainty, the value of a commodity is inextricably tied to its real or potential movement, right? To whether, when, and under what conditions it moves from the location of its production to the location of its consumption or use. This means that in a capitalist market economy, securing the conditions of a commodity's mobility is one of the key preoccupations of organized power. And also, therefore, a key site for the potential disruption of organized power. According to Mitchell, the primary means by which political power and claims can be assembled in relation to the movement of carbon energy is sabotage. Now, the word sabotage derives from the French verb saboter, which originally referred to the unruly noise made by peasants banging their sabots, or wooden shoes, right? and which now means primarily to make a mess, or to botch, or to ruin, or to foul. And of course, we know there's a long history of workers fouling machinery, or other industrial processes as part of work actions. And even in Canada, we have relatively recent experiences, in this province especially, right, of environmental sabotage, including downwinders, fouling energy installations as a protest tactic, etc. It's important to keep in mind that for Mitchell, sabotage is not reducible to isolated acts of property damage, right? but rather entails the organized interruption of the movement of a commodity, which may or may not involve physically damaging the means by which it is moved in any given instance. In what I think is a crucial insight, right, in a crucial insight, Mitchell contends that sabotage, the ability to exert control over flows by interrupting them, is also the central means by which capitalists assemble, exert, and maintain power in a carbon economy. Okay? And here, Mitchell draws on the account of sabotage given by Thorsten Veblen, who was also an influence on Harold Innes, in his 1921 treatise, The Engineers and the Price System, in which Veblen demonstrates that sabotage by both workers and businessmen <coughs> is part of what he calls the ordinary conduct of business in any community that is organized on the price system. That is to say, Veblen writes, in no such community, in no community organized on market principles, can the industrial system be allowed to work at full capacity for any appreciable interval of time 
on pain of business stagnation and consequent privation for all classes and conditions of men. The requirements of profitable business will not tolerate it. So the rate and volume of output has to be regulated by keeping short of maximum production by more or less as the condition of the market may require. In other words, profitable business under market conditions demands what Veblen calls a voluminous running administration of sabotage, which he cheekily invoking an expression coined by the Wobblies defines as the conscientious withdrawal of efficiency. So Mitchell's story is the story or the history of the institutionalization of this control. Right? The building and maintenance of what he calls a voluminous running administration of sabotage. That is the global energy economy. Right? But there's another side to the story because systems designed to enable sabotage by those who manage them are also vulnerable to sabotage by those who do not. Flows of energy commodities are subject to interruption and throttling not only by and in the interests of those seeking rents from those commodities, but also by and in the interest of those whose capacity to disrupt flows can be leveraged into other goods and benefits. And it's in this light that energy transportation infrastructure emerges as a site of political possibility. In Mitchell's account, the potential of energy transportation infrastructure to be sabotaged for purposes other than the manipulation of price, that is to say, the potential for this infrastructure to become the site of politics, varies <coughs> according to a given infrastructure specific configuration. Different types of energy infrastructure are differently vulnerable to political sabotage, and he illustrates this with reference to the history of coal transportation in Europe and North America. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, organized workers involved at various points in the transportation of coal in Europe and North America used sabotage to extract a broad range of progressive structural concessions from industrial capital and their governments. These actions were typically led by militant miners' unions, but often spread to or were coordinated with railway workers, dock workers, and marine workers who were also positioned to disrupt the flow of coal through foot dragging, slowdowns, tampering, and strikes. According to Mitchell, their power derived not just from the organizations they formed, the ideas they began to share, or the political alliances they built, but from the extraordinary quantities of carbon energy that could be used to assemble political agency by employing the ability to slow, disrupt, or cut off its supply. Among the benefits that workers in North America and Europe secured by leveraging their ability to sabotage the flow of coal, Mitchell lists the extension of the suffrage, the right to form labor unions and to strike, the right to create workers' political organizations, which went on to be the basis for the formation and election of the first mass-based political parties, labor reforms, including the eight-hour day, social and unemployment insurance programs, protection against job loss due to accident or sickness, and the first public pension schemes. As Mitchell puts it, working people in the industrialized West acquired a power that would have seemed impossible before the late 19th century. So my question is, might the infrastructure for transporting oil provide a similar means for acquiring a power that might otherwise seem impossible? Pipelines, it would seem, set up very well as sites at which flows can be sabotaged. But we should keep in mind that the first pipeline in the United States was built in 1865 specifically to circumvent the power of organized Teamsters to sabotage the transport of oil in barrels carried by horse and wagon. Indeed, in Mitchell's telling, 
A large part of the rationale for the development of oil infrastructure in Europe and the Middle East in the post-war period was to undermine the strength that European and North American trade unions had achieved through their ability to sabotage the conduits of the coal economy. Oil transportation infrastructure was configured specifically to circumvent the politics of sabotage. As he explains, although the oil fields, pumping stations, pipelines and refineries of the Middle East became intense sites of political struggle, they did not offer those involved the same powers to paralyze energy systems and build a more democratic political order. Right? Just as just like organized labor, the energy business learned a thing or two from their experience with coal. Right? The pipeline networks that proliferated as oil replaced coal as the primary source of carbon energy were first of all an infrastructure for the voluminous running administration of sabotage by which the oil business sustained rents <coughs> by periodically throttling the supply of an otherwise abundant resource. But beyond this, pipelines also undermine the potential of unwanted political sabotage, right, in two ways. First, <coughs> pipelines reduced the role of human labor in transporting energy commodities. Right? Unlike coal, oil flows, right, and therefore requires comparatively less human labor for its transportation. The initial construction of pipelines and deep water ports for tankers of course requires considerable labor at the outset, but pipeline and tanker shipping and maintenance require considerably less human labor on an ongoing basis, thus diminishing the potential for sabotage by organized withholding of this labor. The liquidity of oil meant that pumping stations and pipelines could replace railways as means of transporting energy from the site of production to the places where it was used or shipped abroad. These methods of transport did not require teams of humans to accompany the fuel on its journey, to load and unload it at each junction, to, uh, sorry, to continuously operate engines, switches, and signals. As Mitchell puts it, in fact, oil pipelines were invented as a means of reducing the ability of humans to interrupt the flow of energy. The second reason oil transport mitigates the possibility of unwanted, now here, unwanted by business, right, unwanted sabotage, is that the networks for transporting oil are more flexible and adaptable than those that were and are still in some places involved in the transport of coal. This is partly due to the decentralized, distributed, and redundant character of pipeline networks. And also because the relative lightness of oil and the advent of oil tankers in the late 19th century made transoceanic shipping of oil economically feasible. The political implications of carbon energy transported by pipeline and sea vessel were thus profound. And I'm going to quote Mitchell at length here and then we'll leave him aside. Mitchell says, compared to carrying coal by rail, moving oil by sea eliminated the labor of coal heavers and stokers, and thus the power of organized workers to withdraw their labor from a critical point in the energy system. Unlike railways, ocean shipping was not constrained by the need to run on a network of purpose-built tracks of a certain capacity, layout, and gauge. Oil tankers frequently left port without knowing their final destination. They would steam to a waypoint, then receive a destination determined by the level of demand in different regions. This flexibility further weakened the powers of local forces that tried to control sites of energy production. If a labor strike, for example, or the nationalization of an industry affected one production site, oil tankers could be quickly rerouted to supply oil from alternative sites. In other words, whereas the movement of coal tended to follow dendritic networks with branches at each end but a single main channel, creating potential choke points at several junctures. Oil flowed along networks that often had the properties of a grid, like an electricity network, where there's more than one possible path and the flow of energy can switch to avoid blockages or overcome breakdown. Now, Mitchell uses the analogy of electricity here 
But students of communication will have noticed how closely the network dynamic he attributes to the global movement of oil resembles the distributed packet switching architecture we've come to associate with the internet. As we all know, the principle of a distributed network is this. If you have an important commodity, a staple, like say, data, right, that must flow reliably between its source and its destination in order for its value to be realized, you shouldn't restrict its possible movement to a unique path because doing so would leave the system vulnerable to disruption, including sabotage. Better to create multiple redundant paths so that in the event one path is blocked, the, commu the commodity can still proceed to its destination by another route. This is the architectural logic of the internet and also, according to Mitchell, the logic of pipelines. Now, I'm not certain that the rise of the welfare state in the Western liberal democracies can be attributed to the organized sabotage of the movement of coal in the manner that Mitchell suggests. We know there's a lot going on in any history like that, right? And probably a lot more than just intervention in the movement of coal produced all those welfare state measures that I listed before. But his argument, I think, remains incredibly provocative relative to the present situation. Right? Here's what it prompts us to consider. Energy commodities like oil and gas are not just staples. Right? They are the staples. Right? The commodity upon whose movement the movement of all other commodities and so much else depends. And for this reason, securing their movement has to be a major preoccupation of existing configurations of state and economic power. And it is also why the potential disruption of their movement, sabotage, represents a site of such great political possibility. For if an organized and determined collective force could somehow manage to disrupt the movement of these commodities in a sustained way, it could make great demands and achieve great things. Something like this would seem to be on the mind of British Columbian environmental activist Zepra Berman, who I imagine several people in this room know. <laughs> uh, something like this is probably on her mind when she says, it's possible that we can take hold of this rare moment in history to engage beyond our everyday lives and achieve something great. Right? A hope which calls to mind a line from the great Marxist historian E.P. Thompson, who in the essay, Sir, Writing by Candlelight, wrote, it is only when the power workers throw across the switches and look out into a darkness of their own making that the servants know suddenly the great unspoken fact about our society, their own daily power. And so we might ask, <coughs> where does it stand with sabotage in relation to the Alberta oil sands pipeline? So I have just a few provisional observations about this. There are few, but long. <laughs> right, okay. So the first is that if there is a time for sabotage in relation to the bitumen fields of Alberta, it is definitely now. Right? This is not only because many of the pipelines are not yet built, nor even approved, but more because of the considerable urgency presently felt by both state and capital to get bitumen moving to market. Right? As I've said, energy transportation infrastructure is about facilitating managerial sabotage over the long term, which sometimes involves throttling supply in order to bowie prices and maintain rents. Right? However, under present conditions, it would seem that the priority for the states and companies invested in the oil sands is clearly to get their product moving quickly and in great volumes. In other research that I've been doing, I've been tracing the campaign by the Canadian state and the energy industry and the business community more generally to cast the building of oil sands pipelines as a national imperative of unprecedented historical urgency. And the case for that being true rests on a willingness to accept the claim that the national interest and the interests of the energy industry are identical. They are not, but for the state and industry, the urgency is certainly real, 
right? And this makes them vulnerable. They are caught in what Innes once described as the Staples trap. Right? Having invested massive capital in order to develop and extract this resource, they now need to sell it as quickly as possible in order to recoup that investment. And in order to do that, they need transportation infrastructure. The tremendous industrial and state interest in building infrastructure to move oil sands bitumen to market means that the political potential of sabotage, the potential to extract otherwise impossible political gains by disrupting the movement of this commodity in a decisive way, is higher now than it has been in some time. And certainly higher than it will be if and when these pipelines are built. And this leads to a second reason for thinking that when it comes to sabotage, the time is now. And that, that is that sabotage will become less effective and have less potential after the network for transporting bitumen out of the Appalachian achieves its highly redundancy. Right? Maps of the current configuration of oil sands pipelines show that the network has not yet quite reached the level of a fully distributed network that can tolerate um, local interruptions by simply rooting around them, right? This is the problem that multiple pipelines projected to carry oil sands crude in multiple directions to multiple markets is intended to solve, right? Along with those well-known proposals that I mentioned already, you know, we hear about the Alberta government studying the feasibility of another pipeline up the Mackenzie River Valley, as I mentioned, interest in Manitoba are floating the idea of a, of a pipeline up to the port at Churchill, right? So there's this move to increase redundancy. And of course, beyond pipelines, North American railroads, right, are doing a booming business transporting crude by rail to the tune of 400,000 barrels per day, making crude shipments the fastest growing product for class one railroads in North America, despite tragedies such as that that was visited upon the community of Lake Megantic in Quebec recently. Documents recently obtained by Greenpeace indicate that CN Rail has approached Natural Resources Canada with a plan, reportedly at the urging of uh, Chinese oil sands operator Nexon Incorporated, to develop capacity to ship seven trains a day of oil sands crewed to Prince Rupert to match the Northern Gateway's uh, projected capacity in the event that that pipeline's not approved. Now, taking into account what Mitchell said about the vulnerability of coal shipped by rail, we might see this as a development with considerable saboteurial potential. Right? But this potential is mitigated, I think, by the fact that rail conduits are only one among a number of redundant routes being planned out of the oil sands, and so also contribute to hardening the network as a whole against interruption at any single point. And while the particular geography uh, of BC's Douglas Channel and Salish Sea and Burrard Inlet might raise interesting possibilities for saboteurial marine blockades of oil sands tankers. The sheer number of tidewater ports envisioned by current pipeline and rail proposals is also likely to mitigate the disruptive potential of any one of these. So we're thus in the beginning stages. Oh, I don't want to go there yet. We're in the beginning stages of the development of a distributed, multiply rooted network for transporting oil whose redundancy will progressively diminish the political potential of sabotage. Confronted by local disruption at any point in the system, the oil will simply flow around it. It's this reality, I think, which led the US State Department to conclude in its recent report on the proposed Keystone XL pipeline expansion that this single pipeline on its own will not have an appreciable impact on whether the oil sands are developed or even at what rate, right? Uh, TransCanada CEO Russ Gerling said a couple of months ago in a kind of sm gesture of smug condescension to anti-Keystone activists, we've got a lot of other things on the go, right? This doesn't mean that the development of Keystone is unimportant to the company or that activists are wasting their time opposing it, it just confirms that the effectiveness of a politics of sabotage is limited by the extensiveness and redundancy of the transportation network as a whole. Last month, the Wall Street Journal reported that refiners along the US Gulf Coast don't care if Keystone gets built because they're confident that oil sands and other crude will find its way to them one way or another. 
growing redundancy mitigates against the potential of a politics of sabotage oriented towards leveraging significant collective gains. If your aim is to prevent the company from running the pipe through your town or your property, that's one thing. But if your hope is to extract a broader political change or benefit, this will require a level of disruption uh, which the oil simply can't go around. Right? For sabotage to work, it has to happen <coughs> while alternate, alternate routes to market are still relatively limited. Another thing that we might consider in relation to the potential for a saboteurial politics around oil sands infrastructure is the question of who might be able to carry it out. Right? Who and where are the saboteurial subjects? Who could stop the movement of this, com this commodity and use that power to make otherwise impossible political gains? Well, first of all, a state could. Right? There is a long history of political sabotage of the flow of oil by states and the elites that control them. It's commonplace to think of the Arab states of the Middle East and even some Latin American regimes this way, but state sabotage is also the name for Trudeau's national energy policy in the 1970s, Alberta Premier Peter Lougheed's response to it, throttling the supply of oil to eastern Canada, let the eastern bastards freeze in the dark, right, that's sabotage, right, uh, and even recent threats to oppose the traverse of oil sands pipelines by your own premier here in British Columbia, though it increasingly appears that these are empty and cynical, right. We could even think <coughs> of the various state organized licensing, regulatory, and environmental assessment processes as sites of state facilitated sabotage of pipeline developments in which companies seeking to move their commodities are forced to meet certain conditions, adhere to certain public interest standards, provide a range of benefits that they would not otherwise provide. In this way, the liberal democratic state is certainly an important possible site for the exercise of sabotage, right? Uh, as recent examples such as the Northern Gateway Joint Review Panel hearings and even historic examples such as the McKenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry in the 1970s would suggest. But it would probably be a mistake to expect much by way of sabotage from the Canadian state these days, given the decreasing distance between both the declared interests and the personnel of the petrochemical industry and the governments of Alberta and Canada, and especially given the latter's systematic gutting of those agencies, processes, and regulatory regimes by which the state might previously have been able to monitor the industry and effectively compel its compliance, right? These days, the Canadian state seems to have no other interest than to aggressively promote the development of the Athabasca oil sands and the rapid export of bitumen. Now, of course, in Mitchell's account, the major carrier of the progressive potential of sabotage in relation to the movement of energy commodities has historically been organized labor. This stands to reason, given the gravity of the undertaking, right? Chaining oneself to a bulldozer, clearing a right of way for a pipeline, definitely takes commitment and guts and it might slow down the proceedings for a few hours or even a few days. But what really makes things happen by preventing things from happening is when the labor and technical expertise required to construct or operate a key infrastructure is collectively withdrawn and withheld until a real transformative demand is met. That takes large numbers, it takes organization, discipline, endurance, and I think especially the resolve and capacity to collectively absorb the sacrifices and punishment that inevitably accompany political action the moment things get serious. Right? This is especially true nowadays, I think, <coughs> when the tolerance of both the state and public opinion for disruptive political action is very low. And this actually points, I think, to an interesting difference between the politics of publicity and the politics of sabotage. 
right? that which is often considered a liability to a politics of publicity, right? to a politics aimed at generating positive public opinion, right? Right? this inconvenience or this liability of seriously inconvenience people, inconveniencing people by disrupting the flow of a key commodity, especially an energy commodity, right? that's really a liability from the point of view of a politics of publicity. This is actually an asset, right? From the perspective of a politics of sabotage, whose key aim is to intensify pressure by creating an intolerable situation that demands a serious concession for its resolution. So in this light, we might consider a recent example of organized energy workers using their effective control over infrastructure to sabotage the movement of petroleum in an effort to gain a concession that otherwise seemed impossible. <coughs> in October 2010, unionized refinery workers in France struck 12 refineries and fuel depots across the country, blocking the movement of fuel into and out of them, paralyzing the system for over a week and causing massive fuel shortages across the country. The strikes were mounted in protest over the Sarkozy government's changes to France's retirement and pension system, whereby the general retirement age would be raised from 60 to 62, in line with austerity measures being undertaken throughout Europe in response to the debt crisis. The blockades were put down by police and the strikes were abandoned, leaving the Sarkozy government to enact its changes. But in the ensuing election, Sarkozy was defeated and the socialist government <coughs> Francois Hollande reversed the changes. Now, whether that was a good idea or not, from a macroeconomic perspective, is hard to say. Right? France's unemployment rate is the highest in its history, and the, its debt is staggering. My point is simply that it was a move that many believed to be impossible under the regime of austerity that has settled in across Europe, and yet it was achieved at least partly through an extraordinary act of sabotage by organized workers. So this raises the question of whether we can reasonably expect organized workers in Canada to lead or even participate in sabotaging the movement of oil sands bitumen in order to achieve some broader political goal. Right? In this case, it's important, I think, to consider that what distinguished the case of the French refinery workers was not only the militant history of their unionism, but also the fact that their political goal had nothing to do with the commodity whose movement they were blocking. Right? The issue for them was retirement, pensions, and who should bear the burdens of austerity, not oil. Right? And while it might be interesting to think about what other goals Canadian energy workers might consider mobilizing themselves in defense of, the real stakes of sabotage in this context right? is the resource itself, right? whose movement they might be able to disrupt by refusing to build or operate the infrastructure that moves, moves it. The issue is not whether Canadian energy workers are prepared to enact sabotage to force a change in legislation concerning temporary foreign workers in order to protect their jobs, for example. I mean, they might be. I'm not sure how progressive that would be, but you know, the issue is whether they're prepared to enact sabotage in order to achieve the seemingly impossible goal of preventing the oil sands from being developed at all. Right? As the anarchist scholar David Graeber wrote, commenting on the French refinery strikes in relation to the environmental justice movement, do we really expect workers in the petroleum industry to join us in a struggle to eliminate the petroleum industry? To strike for their right not to be petroleum workers? Right? Graeber thinks the answer is yes, because he thinks unionized workers and anarchist environmentalists share common cause in resisting the work and productivity regimes enforced by neoliberal capitalism. That's conceivable at a certain level of abstraction, but to what extent it pertains on the ground in the oil patch right, is an open question. One of my research assistants conducted a comprehensive review of Canadian trade union positions on oil sands development in, in general and on pipeline projects associated with the oil sands in particular, particularly the Northern Gateway and Keystone pipelines, and looked at a broad range of unions whose members work on pipeline construction and operation and related transportation uh, workers, including rail, and also provincial labor councils and trades federations reviewed their submissions to the NEB's Joint Review Panel on the Northern Gateway, 
material published on their websites, statements by their representatives in the press. And as you might imagine, there's a wide diversity of positions on the various issues at stake here. But if we had to generalize, we would say that the position of organized labor on the pipelines and oil, stand, oil sands development generally falls into two camps. The first includes those unions whose members are involved in the construction of pipelines and their related infrastructure and who therefore have the most to gain from the jobs that will be created by these projects. Even though it's well known that these jobs, while reasonably well paying, are mostly short term and temporary, right? and that labor incomes will be minuscule compared to the business profits arising from these projects. In this category, we would list the 13 national and international unions affiliated uh, under the Building Construction Trades Department of the AFL-CIO, or also known as Canada building, Canada's Building Trades Unions. The Teamsters, whose members clear and build roads and pipeline rights of way, and also represent many railway workers, and unions representing plumbers, pipe fitters, welders, carpenters, electricians, operating engineers, and boilermakers. These unions work to secure jobs for their members against, for example, temporary foreign and non-unionized workers. They work uh, to, um, for high rates of compensation and benefits for their workers, good working conditions, arguing, among other things, that all of these ensure that pipelines will be built with the highest level of expertise and to the highest standards of environmental care, regulatory compliance, and safety. Second category includes associations representing workers in the broader swath of the economy in Alberta, as well as those who work in other areas of the energy sector, particularly refining. Right? This would include the Alberta Federation of Labor, the United Steelworkers, the Communication Energy and Paper Workers Union. And the position of these unions is quite complex. They have come out in opposition to the Northern Gateway and Keystone pipelines, largely on the grounds that Canadian economic policy should encourage value-added processing of resources domestically, and that by exporting unprocessed bitumen, these pipelines will also export long-term jobs and economic benefits that could be retained by refining the bitumen here before shipping it to market. This would suggest that these unions are not opposed to the oil sands or to pipelines per se, just to their development in ways that don't fully exploit the value added potential of the resource. This is mostly true, but it's also the case that these unions are making this case uh, in terms of a call for a broader national uh, energy policy for Canada that would see the country gradually wean itself off its economically and ecologically dangerous dependency on oil and instead work toward a more um, environmentally and economically sustainable energy system, a future to which they see bitumen exporting pipelines as antithetical. And so to this end, for example, steel workers and, and the energy workers have formed a consortium with the Pembina Institute and Environmental Defense Canada called Blue Green Canada to press for a national sustainable energy policy. So does this mean that Canadian petroleum workers have joined us in the struggle to eliminate the petroleum industry? that we can expect them to strike for the right not to be petroleum workers, that they might lead and sustain the sort of sabotage that would stop the bitumen flowing, not in order to achieve some other goal, but as the goal itself. Hard to say. I would say probably not. Uh, but these politics are unfolding. If not unionized workers, then who? Right? Then who? What about the multifaceted transnational social movement that has seized upon the strategy of disrupting the approval and construction of additional pipelines for moving bitumen to market? Right? This is a movement that gathers a diverse constituency uh, with a diversity of motivations and priorities. Some are worried about pipelines and tankers and spills in their backyards. Some oppose the disruption of ecosystems by this sort of infrastructure. Some want to ensure fair compensation for those whose property is disturbed by pipelines. Some understand that the only way to ensure that environmental protection, regulatory oversight, and public benefits are attached to developments such as these is well-organized and con uh, constant mobilization. Some, many, and maybe even most, understand that opposing this or that oil sands pipeline is actually about opposing the development of the oil sands in general, which is itself about laying a claim to a future 
in which the burning of non-renewable fossil fuels gives way to more sustainable and less devastating ways of energizing our lives and societies. Right? The various elements of this pluralistic movement have deployed a dazzling array of tactics and media and have exhibited equally remarkable degrees of solidarity and resolve. And they seem to understand the opportunity presented by the fact that among the many qualities that make oil such a valuable commodity, the one that makes it most valuable to political activists is its need to move. Maud Barlow of the Council of Canadians said at a November 2012 meeting in Toronto to organize protest against the Line 9B reversal, which again, as I said, is, hap is, is proposed for um, Central Canada. The pipelines are the bloodlines of the oil sands. If we can keep these arteries from being built, then they can't expand the oil sands. To this point, <coughs> uh, the, I think by and large the politics of this movement has been a strategy of liberal democratic publicity aimed at mobilizing and informing public engagement in the approvals process and turning public opinion against pipeline developments by raising awareness of their risks and stakes. The direct aim here is to persuade regulatory and licensing agencies to deny permits for the construction of specific oil sands pipelines. Should those permissions nevertheless be granted, the secondary aim is to undermine their democratic legitimacy by showing that despite their formal approval, these pipeline developments are at odds with both the public interest as expressed in these formal settings and public opinion more broadly. In this event, the hope is to persuade elected officials that the electoral costs of proceeding with such, with such projects is too high to bear, even though they've been formally approved. Now, it remains to be seen whether this sort of sabotage by publicity, as I would call it, right, whether this sort of sabotage by publicity will be ultimately successful. Right? There are interesting indications, right? We know in its draft finding on the, uh, the Northern Gateway application, the Joint Review Panel signaled that it could attach as many as 199 conditions to the project should it decide to issue a permit. Conditions which conceivably could lead the company to forego developing the pipeline, right? Many of these are directly attributable to concerns expressed by opponents and critics of the project during the hearings process. And public opinion has definitely played a role, right, in kind of persuading BC politicians, right, to take a stand one way or another on the development of this, these pipelines. And in some cases to insist on their own versions of public interest conditions in exchange for um, support. Now this all might succeed, right, it all might succeed in scuttling the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Right? And then the question would be whether the massive publicist effort right, right, required to win that victory, right, that saboteurial victory, right, the massive effort that it's taken, right, whether that could be sustained or replicated as effectively over the long term as pipeline companies eager to connect bitumen producers and oil markets respond to such obstructions by repeatedly trying to go another way and by sharpening their own efforts to marginalize opposition and win public opinion to their side. Right? So my point is not at all to kind of gainsay the achievements of this remarkable social movement engaged in opposing these pipelines. Right? It's simply to say that when it comes to stopping the movement of this commodity, public awareness and public opinion, right, what Jürgen Habermas once called the unforced force of the better argument, right, might not finally be enough. It's hard to imagine the Harper and Redford governments being persuaded on the merits of the case alone not to allow exploitation of the Athabasca oil sands. And no one can seriously suppose that the world's most powerful oil companies will simply be talked out of the multiple billions of dollars sitting there waiting for them in the fields around Fort McMurray. <laughs> Stopping this will likely require something more than arguments 
right, derived from sound science and public interest economics bolstered by public opinion, it will likely require what we might call the forced force of the better argument, a politics of sabotage that exceeds publicity. Now, if there are any if there are signs of this possibility, I think they might be found in the stance that's been taken by those First Nations who have stepped up to oppose these developments. It goes without saying, of course, that Aboriginal people in Canada have diverse opinions on these pipelines. Right. They also have a long informative history in reckoning with the consequences of pipelines traversing their territories right, that stretches back to the Berger inquiry into the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline proposal in the 1970s. As you well know here in this province, in 2010, the leaders of 130 First Nations signed the Save the Fraser Declaration in which they pledged, <coughs> we will not allow the proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline or similar oil sands project to cross our lands, territories and watershed, or the ocean migration routes of Fraser River salmon. Right. At the same time, nine First Nations of the Central and North Pacific Coast in Haida Gwaii signed the Coastal First Nations Declaration in which they declare that oil tankers carrying crude oil from the Alberta oil sands will not be allowed <coughs> to transit our lands and waters. Right. That is talk of sabotage by people who know a thing or two about it about how to do it, about what it takes, and what to expect in response. People impressed by the gravity of ancestral obligation and a sense of collective responsibility toward the future. Right? This situation calls to mind um, Peter Van Wyck's moving account of the Dene of Great Bear Lake, from whose lands was extracted the uranium used in the bombs dropped on Japan in 1945 and over whose lands uh, that material would move along with what he called the highway of the atom. Then, as now, dispossessed First Nations people were not in a position to decide or control what would be done with the rocks taken from and over their ground. Right? But still, as Van Wyck puts it, despite that fact, or as I have come to expect because of it, it is that for which they come to assume <coughs> responsibility, infinitely. Right. So if there is indeed any potential for serious disruption of the movement of bitumen out of Alberta, I think it will be sustained only by this sort of assumption of infinite responsibility and a preparedness to assume whatever burdens that entails. Last week, the federal government dispatched a platoon of deputy ministers to British Columbia, that's not them. Uh, <laughs> right, to meet with the leaders of those Aboriginal communities and organizations that have done so well to position themselves in the field of saboteurial politics in relation to oil sands pipelines and tankers that will cross their territory and waters. The game is on, and soon we will have more to say about whether sabotage, as I have been discussing it, provides a productive critical framework for thinking about the politics of pipelines, and maybe even about politics more generally. But to close, I want to say that there is, I think, one, at least one, I'm sure I'll hear about more, <laughs> large, unresolved question that looms over this possibility of the politics of sabotage as relates to oil pipelines. And that is this. The basic logic of political sabotage is the quid pro quo. Right? In exchange for this, we will give you that. In exchange for restoring the lower retirement age, we will allow the gasoline trucks to leave the refinery. In exchange for collective bargaining rights, we will let you move the coal again. Typically, Political saboteurs must hold out a demand in exchange for which they agree to quit their disruption and allow the infrastructure to return to smooth functioning. When alternatives are limited and resolve is strong, it's this which provides incentive 
for capital and state to capitulate, sometimes spectacularly. But in these cases, the saboteur's relationship to the infrastructure they have seized and to the commodity whose movement they are disrupting is strictly instrumental. Their objection is not to that infrastructure or to that commodity. Right? These are merely the means that they use to achieve some other otherwise unrelated end. Unionized miners and rail workers had no problem with coal. Right? They just didn't want to lose their jobs if they got sick. What happens when the seized infrastructure, and in the case of the Alberta oil sands pipe, pipelines, infrastructure that is seized in advance of its being built, right? What happens when the seized infrastructure and the commodity it would carry are themselves the issue, right? When the saboteurs are not in it simply to extract some other benefit or just to have the pipeline built somewhere else, right? In this case, they can't exactly say, we'll suspend our disruption and allow this pipeline to be built in exchange for a guarantee that it will not be built and a promise that the resource intended to flow through it will never be developed. Give us that and you can build your pipeline and move the oil again. The construction doesn't make sense when there's a non-instrumental relationship to the infrastructure and the commodity, when that is the problem itself, right? right. In such cases, Right? We're disrupting the movement of a given commodity as both the means and the objective of the act of sabotage. The stakes are raised considerably and the politics are complicated significantly. Right? And so there is something unresolvable, I think, so far at least in my own thinking, about the possibility of thinking about politics around these pipelines under the framework of sabotage. So I'll stop there and take uh, barbs and questions. <laughs> <laughs>